right, it is 3.01 here on the East Coast, uh, just afternoon on the West Coast. Welcome to our webinar on acquiring emerging technologies. I'm Michelle Johnson, communications manager here at the Acquisition Research Program at Naval Postgraduate School. I want to just take a, a few minutes to introduce you to how today's event will go and who our speakers are, and then we'll get into the fun of it. <clears throat> um, but first, we'll have a Q&A after everyone has, has talked, after our presenters have gone. Um, you can use the, you're probably all very familiar with Zoom at this point, right? Uh, you can use the, the buttons at the bottom there. Q&A will send questions up to the panelists and to me, the host. As attendees, you will also be able to see those questions and vote on the ones that you want to see answered. So please like monitor those and see if there's something good in there or add your own. We will answer those after everyone has presented and hopefully there'll be a good amount of time to, to talk through those, those comments and questions. There's also the chat box. Feel free to use that chat box over there. <clears throat> I'll post a little hi um, to you all to see where everyone is coming from in just a minute. Um, so please uh, engage with us that way. Um, a little bit about who ARP is. I think most of you are members of the ARP community. So it's wonderful to see you in this virtual space. Uh, the Acquisition Research Program has been around since 2003 at the Naval Postgraduate School. It was created to uh, form an academic home for acquisition research, which didn't have a, a place yet. And we're honored to have, have been that home for the past 18 years um, and, and, and doing a nice job with that. So next year, we're, um, we'll have the 19th Annual Acquisition Research Symposium. We just sent out a call for proposals for that if you're interested in sharing your research with us there. And that's in my mind because we're only one year away from the 20th, uh, right? So it will be a, a nice big hallmark for us. Um, we work at ARP to connect NPS faculty and students to the larger community. We work closely with uh, policymakers, with leaders in the Navy and in across DOD um, researchers from across kind of the acquisition innovation ecosystem and uh, uh, think tanks, um, all kinds of people who are engaged in the process of making defense acquisition better. Um, our, our big contribution is the student program. We work with between 50 and 75 students every year to support their research and that's usually through the Graduate School of Defense Management here at the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, we also have a collection of all the research that we have supported, whether that's student or faculty or from the symposium um, or from other publications, grant supported in our collection on our website. That's called DARE, the Defense Acquisition Innovation Repository. If you haven't checked that out, go look. It has um, over 3,000 reports in there. So it's kind of a good one-stop shop for, for resources there. Um, and as I always already mentioned, we have our symposium every May. It used to be in beautiful Monterey, California, both in 2021 and 2022, it will be a virtual offering. Um, you can admire the California poppies on Dave Lewis's background if you're looking for a sense of what it looks like to be in Monterey. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna do one thing and then introduce our speakers quickly. I have a poll for you guys. Um, since you're here, um, to learn about acquiring emerging technologies, I thought it would be an interesting test to see how do we define emerging technologies. So take a minute, please look at those and see which of those five options makes the most sense to you. We still got votes coming in. Say 10 more seconds. Right now we have a clear front winner. I don't want to tell you what it is yet. Maybe a 10 second countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. People on the phone probably can't vote. Uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, here, I should be able to share these results with everyone. Um, so you guys seen that? That's excellent. Uh, Cool, so uh, our, our, our big vote is a technology that could be disruptive. Um, I put what I thought was a funny answer in there, any technology that is near to DOD, because it seems like, you know, <laughs> that could be a lot of things. Um, thank you, and we'll see if our panelists help give us some insight into, into what those technologies might be and how do we get them 
on, on contract and into, into the fielding uh, for, for DOD. <clears throat> all right, very quickly, I wanna tell you who will be presenting and then I will ask them all to, to tell a little bit more as, uh, as we get into their uh, particular presentations. We'll be starting off with David Lewis. He is currently the chair of acquisition here at the Naval Postgraduate School. And David has been one year and one day since uh, <laughs> I think he joined us. Uh, so welcome, he's done a lot in, in this first year and a, a lot more good stuff to come. Um, prior to joining NPS, uh, Dave was director of the Defense Contract Management Agency. And prior to that, he had a long career as a Navy officer in communications, as well as a lot of shipbuilding, both on the building side and the procurement side. And he can talk more about um, his specific areas of expertise there. He is also one of our three NPS alumni uh, to be on this, this panel. <clears throat> uh, you can ask him about his research uh, when, uh, <laughs> when you get to Q&A. Uh, Dave will start us off. Next will be Mike Madsen. Mike Madsen is currently Director of Strategic Engagement at Defense Innovation uh, Unit and um, has been doing that for a little over three years now. Mike and I met at the Section 809 panel, which was one of the coolest uh, experiences. I think we both talked about this that we've had professionally. And um, uh, he was chief of staff and then executive director there um, and learned a lot of stuff about companies who didn't wanna work with, with DOD um, in, in your research. And I think that helped you transition on over to, to DIU. Um, also an NPS alum, and I really hope that he will talk about his research um, his thesis, because he shared that with us in the practice session, and it's really funny and uh, kind of sad. <laughs> um, previously, uh, Mike also worked at CAPE, Cost Assessment Program Evaluation. Did I decode that right? Yeah, you decoded that exactly right. It's where uh, the services submit their budget uh, to put together the president's budget. Perfect. And uh, a C-130J pilot, right? And C-17. Ah, excellent. Um, so Mike will be second. Following Mike will be Chris Manuel. He is currently the director of one of the newest Naval X Tech Bridges, the Central Coast Tech Bridge. Here, partnered with a Naval Postgraduate School, and dual hatted, I think, as an associate dean of research for technology and development. So, kind of working to to do both those things. He is also an NPS alumni with a degree in defense analysis. Um, and in his, uh, his life story was at NPS, went over to industry for a while and then came back to help bring him some, some of that, that tech expertise to the NPS community. Um, and then finally, Jonathan Munn is professor of research here at Naval Postgraduate School. He is our only non-alum, um, but we'll take it because he's such a prolific member of both the acquisition community and the NPS community. He supported a lot of students um, and they, they've been putting out great research with, with his support as well as his own prolific research. Um, he has 32 books out there, and I like the fun fact of 22 patents or patents pending, um, and uh, expertise in advanced decision analytics, which we'll be talking about today, quantitative risk modeling, and some other smart things. Um, he's also CEO of Real Options Valuation Incorporated, so another dual-hatted expert on our panel today. With that, I will stop talking and um, over to Dave Lewis to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, when uh, I went to NPS as a student, it was in the weapons engineering curriculum, which I discovered when I got there was not accredited. Uh, I, that didn't sit well with me, so I ended up getting a master's in computer science along with my weapons engineering uh, P code is what the Navy calls it in artificial intelligence. And uh, unfortunately, I picked the wrong branch of artificial intelligence. So nothing that applies today. Uh, so in talking about acquiring emergent technologies, my Navy career has been largely in production and delivery, uh, which means I spent a lot of time with program managers standing somewhere on a ship looking at a piece of equipment that doesn't work. And they're saying, well, it worked in the lab. Uh, it worked in the model. And, uh, and then trying to figure out why it doesn't actually work on the ship. So I'm sensitized to that particular area. So I thought that's what I'd talk about today. So uh, when it comes to acquiring two new technologies, I kind of bucket it into three things, inventing something, productizing something, and then fielding it. And as I intimated, I'm going to talk about fielding. 
Uh, I'm riffing off of a Secretary of, Na of the Navy Danzig uh, paper, white paper written in 2011 called Driving in the Dark. And it's about our inability to predict the future. Uh, quite good, it's an easy read. Uh, I recommend you uh, uh, call it up. Uh, I think it, uh, it's superb. And, and personally, I think everybody should read it like every couple of weeks. Um, so in the future, what's the requirement? I think we don't know our operational environment, our future operational environment. We don't know the operational demands of that environment. And we don't know what technology we're going to have in that environment. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm a big student of military history. I can't think of a modern war since like Napoleon, where the new technology that was in play when the war started worked like it was supposed to work. Uh, the, war, uh, the war didn't progress like the war was supposed to progress given the technology. And uh, and the operational forces often generally didn't know what to do with the technology and often couldn't figure it out during the course of that particular war. Uh, so so I, don't, I, think, I feel like I'm on pretty solid ground with my uh, requirement statement. Uh, I am gonna talk about platforms and mostly ships and airplanes, but I would say platforms could be satellites, it could be uh, command centers, it could be fleet headquarters, it could be you know, a lot of things. Um, and because we don't know, I think we won't know what the next war is gonna be like, and we'll probably still be using platforms. Uh, I would offer that I think platforms have to be open, adaptable, modular, and have a flexible architecture to best able to quickly receive whatever new technology is produced by the first two steps in, in the process. So uh, they need to embark things rather than installing things. Uh, need to have low barriers to adoption, make it easy to put something on a platform in an operational environment. Uh, and the platforms themselves, the people that build platforms, like me as a shipbuilder, uh, need to focus more on infrastructure, platform infrastructure, like size, uh, margins, displacement, power, those sort of things, rather than on the particular weapons of that platform, because they're probably going to change. Uh, and in fact, the history says they will change. Uh, and, and I would say there's a nuance to that, that we tend to design to allow for certain technologies. I would say we need to design to not, not prevent unknown technologies from being installed on ships and airplanes. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. So a couple of communities in the Navy have done really well at this. All, like Churchill said, only after trying everything else first. Uh, that was a, a Churchill's opinion of Americans' a strategy. I always, I always have the best strategy, but only after doing everything else first. Uh, so when aviation first came out, every new weapon, a bomb, a torpedo, whatever, had to have a new airplane. Uh, so if you came up with a new torpedo, you had to design and build a new airplane. If you wanted a bomber, you had to drop bombs at a certain range you design and build a new airplane. So you ended up with this proliferation of single mission airplanes. And uh, uh, at the time in the 1920s, 1930s, it was not hard to design an airplane. The P-51 was famously designed in hundred days. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that hard to do that. Uh, as uh, time passed and we got into jet airplanes and radars and you know supersonic speeds and stuff, it became obvious that designing new airplanes every time somebody came up with a new weapon isn't gonna work. So things like bomb bays, which are just a big open space, started to be seen as open architecture, flexible places to put things. The B-52 is probably the best exemplar of that. It was designed for nuclear weapons, but you could drop conventional weapons, you could shoot missiles out of it. There's a lot of things you could do. You could put uh, cruise missiles out of it. So uh, the, P the B-52 has shown itself to be a very adaptable modern airplane by using uh, the, the space available, the modular space available in Bombay. And then on other airplanes and the B-52, you have hard points and it became apparent that you could stick other things on those hard points other than bombs. Uh, good example of that is uh, F-4 Phantom was the two was designed to be an all missile airplane, got to Vietnam, turns out you needed guns. So, uh, uh, engineers were able to design a gun pod for the F-4. Not great, but it was better than no gun at all. 
Uh, and you see that in aviation today uh, with airplanes that carry a wide, wide variety of weapons and to innovate technologically in airplanes, you need to, uh, you mostly need to adapt to the interface available to the airplane. Aircraft carriers are another example. Um, initially, very closely uh, designed like battleships and destroyers. The problem was in the 1920s, airplanes uh, changed every 18 to 20 months. It took three to five years to build a ship. So by the time a ship came out with airplanes, the airplanes that had been designed to uh, fly didn't exist anymore. So airplane designers had to quickly learn to separate out, to loosely couple the ship and the, air, and the aircraft uh, through a series of interface points like wind over deck, uh, elevators, uh, that sort of stuff. And that allowed rapid changes. So when World War II uh, started and all of the theories about how a naval war was gonna happen during World War II proved to be mostly wrong, uh, the aircraft carriers were uniquely able to adapt to that. A good example, probably the best example, is the Doolittle Raid in 1942, where in four months, the Navy figured out how to fly Army bombers off of an aircraft carrier and conduct a land strike uh, off of the USS Hornet. Nobody ever said that was a requirement, uh, and nobody imagined that that could have been a requirement. But in fact, uh, that's it was, and it, and it happened. And that was because of the open architecture in the aircraft carrier. That really made a big difference. And then you see that uh, through the history of the aircraft carrier. So the reason aircraft carriers are the queens of the seas are today is not because they're big and cool, it's because you can do anything with them. Change the airplanes, you change the mission. Uh, very low barriers to innovation. Uh, best example right now is the USS Carl Vinson, which just deployed with the F-35C. A 35-year-old ship is deployed with the most modern uh, strike fighter in the inventory. And, and that has not happened in naval, uh, that has not happened in the surface Navy since HMS Victory uh, fought at Trafalgar as a 40 year old ship. So that's why aircraft carriers are so useful today. And I think the aviation and the aircraft carrier are the exemplars of how platforms should be built to receive new technology. So I'll just quickly run through uh, um, what might be some drivers for today and, and uh, future panel, later panels will talk about this, cloud and edge uh, processing. Ships and airplanes need to have a cloud on board. Uh, they are at the edge. Uh, I would say that from a perspective of a UAV or UXV, the ship or the platform is the cloud and they are at the edge. So, uh, so I think there needs to be more in that area in terms of infrastructure. Uh, robust and denied communications. Uh, we have military satellites, but I would say the commercial communications world is uh, what I would call ubiquitous. There are satellites all over the place. And if we're talking on 2G and everybody else is on 5G, that's our problem, not, uh, not their problem. Uh, clearly defined interfaces, I've talked about that, Bombay's hard points. Uh, they need to be as few as possible, clean interfaces. They can be complicated, but they need to be clean. Uh, high margins, I think, are important. You don't know how many uh, uh, radars or missiles or UAVs or UXVs are going to be on there. Need to have the ability to uh, to grow the capability of a platform uh, in order to take on new technologies. As an example, U.S. ships use uh, service combatants use margin of five to twenty five percent. Danish ships use margins of one hundred to three hundred percent, and they are the most modular ships that I know of. Uh, so what's a requirement? Unknown operational environment, unknown operational demands, unknown technology. And I highly recommend uh, Seknav uh, Danzig's paper, Driving in the Dark, and talks about uh, our ability to predict. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions at the, uh, at the end of the presentations. All right, awesome, Dave, thanks. I love the, the sense of emerging technologies. It's not just what we're doing right now, right? There's emerging technologies that's been happening for uh, what, over 100 years now. Um, next up is Mike Madsen. Um, he'll be talking about a Defense Innovation Unit. And Mike, before you begin, I really want you to share the story about your thesis as an NPS student. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll share a, uh, a version uh, for this group. So um, my uh, thesis, I spent uh, 18 months at NPS when I was in the Air Force. It was uh, one of my favorite assignments in the Air Force, partly because it was, well, 
not in the Air Force, and I got to experience a different uh, services culture, but it was really working with and being exposed to some of the big thinkers and the, the strategic thinkers uh, that are collected at uh, NPS. And so it was an incredibly uh, enriching and satisfying experience for me uh, from a uh, academic perspective, a social perspective, as well as a, a professional perspective. Um, and what I focused on was uh, the role of nationalism, national identity, and state building. I uh, used Poland uh, as an example and applied it to uh, to the uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, one of my uh, conclusions was that there was going to be a fracturing of Ukraine uh, right down the middle as each, uh, the East and West identified with uh, the East and West, uh, well, to be quite honest. And that the feedback I received was that uh, the conclusion was wrong, but the process was correct. Uh, and fast forward to uh, 2014, and we actually uh, see events taking place uh, on the eastern border of uh, Ukraine that uh, align with, with some of my thoughts. So it was, it was a, a fun and satisfying process. I, I always love it when research has that, that real world impact. And you know, the, the, the believers didn't, or the non-believers didn't want to trust your research, but, but you knew what you're talking about. Right. right. Um, could you uh, project my slides, Shell? Yep, just give me uh, 10 seconds to pull them up. So she's pulling those up. Uh, I'll start a little preamble on the defense invasion. You know, we started about five years ago at the direction of then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter as a way to illuminate a path to the defense marketplace. In Shell's uh, opening comments, she talked about when we were on the 809 Congressional Advisory Panel, we recognized countries chose not to work with the department, chose not to take part in a $750 billion marketplace, uh, made the business decision to do that. And so that was a, a curious thing. And Secretary of Defense Ash Carter recognized this and attempted to illuminate a path, lowering some of those barriers to entry for some of those companies. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have an office in Austin, Boston, and DC. Uh, next slide. So why do we even care about uh, emerging technology? Um, I just read a comment, I think it was in the Q&A or the comments about uh, during World War II, the British integration of radar into uh, the way that they uh, fight and how it led to, certainly led to uh, the way the uh, outcome of uh, World War II. But Secretary Carter uh, realized that it wasn't enough to develop the technology. Uh, but more importantly, was to be the first to integrate it into uh, the way uh, a, a country fights and get it in the hands of the men and women in uniform. And in fact, I took a, a couple notes from uh, from uh, what Dave's uh, his introductory remarks. Uh, he talked about uh, future conflicts. We won't know the environment. We won't know the technology. Uh, but just like the radar example, certainly. Uh, whoever can best integrate that emerging technology is absolutely going to have some sort of comparative advantage. Next slide. Why do we care about commercial technology? Um, currently, looking at the graph on the right, the commercial sector outspends government by about $250 billion per year in R&D. Uh, and to drive that point home further, the top five uh, tech companies versus the top five traditional defense industrial based companies in their annual R&D spending is uh, uh, off by an order of magnitude. So we want to be positioned to be able to leverage that vast amount of capital uh, that's being injected into uh, R&D in the commercial sector. Next slide. And that takes us back to, uh, I think you go back one, to uh, Ash Carter's initial go do, and that was accelerate uh, uh, adoption of commercial technology for DoD to uh, prove through rapid prototyping uh, and other innovative means of bringing technology to the Department of Defense. We were able to prove that out, rapid prototyping, doing some one offs with a DoD partner. Secretary Mattis uh, came in as a secretary and he, he liked what we were doing, but he charged us with uh, thinking big. He said, look at transforming the capability and capacity of the department by finding those projects that will transform or that will scale uh, across services, uh, across uh, platforms, aircraft, wheeled vehicles, et cetera. And then underpinning all of that is strengthening the national security innovation base, which we see as the a triangle of academia, industry, and government that really birthed Silicon Valley and the tech ecosystem uh, writ large. It's made up of uh, those non-traditional companies. Now, DIU is unique in the innovation space in that uh, we have a project uh, cycle that more closely matches a commercial uh, production cycle uh, so that we're able to leverage those advancements uh, taking place. We seek to increase uh, transparency, 
increase competition and decrease the vendor time, recognizing that time for a lot of early stage companies is critical. They don't have two years to wait for a yes or a no, honestly. Um, they'd rather get a, a no in 30 days than a yes in two years. We also have a mandate to work across the joint force, uh, solving problems for all of the services. And then we have a broad and deep integration into the uh, tech ecosystems. We've developed a specific commercial engagement team to be out involved with tech CEOs and venture capital uh, to understand where the investment is taking place and uh, how that emerging technology might apply to the Defense Department mission set. Next slide. So this is how we do it. This is our commercial solutions opening, what we call. Um, and you can see the problem curation and diligence there. So uh, counter to the commercial engagement team that I just mentioned, we have a defense engagement team that is out working with the DOD partner. Everything starts with a DOD partner uh, from a demand signal. And we get away from a requirements document and instead focus on what is the problem they're trying to solve. And we spend some time curating that with them. So we're not solving a symptom of a problem or a preconceived solution, uh, but rather what is the exact problem. At the same time, our commercial engagement team is out in the commercial ecosystem, uh, making sure that there's a rich, robust collection of vendors that can uh, provide uh, possible solutions to that. The last thing we want is one or two vendors that could do that. So then what we do is working with our DoD partner, we post their problem statement on our website and uh, look for so, uh, uh, proposals from our commercial partners in the form of a five page white paper or a 15 page slide deck. And then we work with the DoD partner to uh, call that down uh, and eventually invite uh, companies in for in-person pitches and then select uh, the company that we're gonna award a prototype contract. And we look to do that in 60 to 90 days. Right now we're about 140 days for a prototype contract, but that's still fairly fast compared to traditional contracting. Then we go through the contracting or the prototyping phase and look to field the technology, whether it's hardware or software in a year or two years, and then seek to transition that to either a production contract, a program of record, or on the GSA schedule as a way to continue uh, producing that technology and integrate it into uh, the way that we fight. Next slide. Thing we've learned in short order is uh, there's been significant energy around the acquisition reform uh, and acquisition process. Uh, we were designed to leverage some of those rapid acquisition statutes and uh, capabilities over the last uh, several years. Uh, but really, we've learned that it should be thought of in the context of the overall process. And while there's been a lot of energy around uh, specific acquisition reform, we need to continue to focus on budgeting reform as well as uh, adjusting the requirements process. Uh, and Dave mentioned uh, a couple of uh, uh, things that uh, I want to pull the thread a little bit on. I uh, talked about modular uh, open system architecture. Uh, that's a, a fantastic way. We need to continue to apply that to uh, other weapon system to make it easy to pull in this emerging technology as it becomes uh, available. And, uh, and our uh, CSO process is an effort to take a look at this uh, holistically, uh, at least an early look. Next slide. So one project I'll use it as an example, uh, we take that holistic uh, look at this rapid analysis of threat exposure. And what this was, was a response uh, to non-battle injuries due to infectious diseases and a way to uh, detect those much earlier uh, via wearables and gathering data, using AI then to uh, analyze that and uh, develop some sort of mechanism mechanism and scale to determine if men and women in uniform were going to uh, succumb to a, an infectious disease before a deployment or other things like that. And it was not initially focused on COVID. In fact, the project almost finished uh, by the time COVID really hit. But what we were able to do, because it was uh, prototyping, we were able to rapidly shift, instead of going back through a requirements process, rapidly shift to the emerging environment and apply this to COVID. Uh, and I think uh, at some point, we had uh, about 8,000 participants in this, and we were able to identify folks that were COVID positive 48 hours before symptoms or testing indicated uh, the same. Uh, you can see our list of DoD partners and our uh, commercial partners there to the right. Next slide. <clears throat> so I mentioned working with our DoD partner. 
Uh, we do that, but we also work with our uh, commercial partners, uh, bringing things to each of those. For our DoD uh, partners, what we do is we, we bring access to leading edge and emerging technology through uh, prototyping, uh, avoiding uh, going back through a requirements process and being able to make real-time adjustments to that prototyping to solve their problems. Um, we also give delivery of that technology at commercial speeds and cycles. For our commercial partners, we illuminate a path to the defense marketplace. We lower barriers to entry. We recognize that time is money. Um, we recognize that uh, we wanna be a, a fast uh, a no, if no is the answer, or a fast yes, if that is the answer. Next slide. So what we see is the, uh, the focus areas. Uh, we're sitting around six tech focus areas. Uh, and you can see them all listed there. We see these as uh, areas undergoing the greatest rate of change in the commercial tech sector, but also aligned with the defense mission set, whether it's kinetic or humanitarian assistance, disaster relief related. Uh, and we're not uh, static. Uh, in fact, we just started the advanced energy and materials portfolio about a year ago, recognizing the, the uh, advancement taking place in the energy and battery sector in the commercial world. Next slide. Uh, briefly, DIU is fairly modestly funded at $70 million, uh, but what we do is we can generate outsized impact by leveraging that huge amount of capital uh, investment in R&D that's taken place in the commercial sector, as well as our DOD partner funding uh, from their appropriated funds. And then you can see the uh, contracts awarded and the solutions that we've transitioned. Next slide. Now, Shell mentioned companies that didn't want to work with uh, DOD initially, uh, that actually made a business decision, evaluated it and said, no, uh, we're not going to do that because you guys are too complex, takes too long or too expensive. And what we've been able to do, you can see we've had 2,300 companies have responded to our solicitations. Uh, we brought on about 190 unique companies that have uh, received uh, awards. You can see them broken down as whether first time uh, or prior DOD uh, experience, and then the, the traditional and the non-traditional companies. And the bulk of the folks we work with uh, are uh, small businesses. Next slide. Uh, now getting into the commercial solutions opening, next slide. So we use the commercial solutions opening process that I described before as a competitive process, but we also use other transaction agreements. And we've used these under the authority of Title 10, uh, Section 2371 Bravo. Uh, OTs are not new. They started with NASA back in the 50s and have uh, been around since then, uh, changed a little bit and slowly uh, evolved. But uh, now that capability is expanded across the department and uh, permanently codified in uh, 2371 Bravo. Uh, and that, that statute also allows us to uh, seamlessly go from prototype OTs to production OTs, provided that the prototype OT was awarded under a competitive uh, situation, and that's what our CSO process satisfies. Uh, our, uh, the authority to operate also stipulates a competitive process uh, that I mentioned, uh, and it favors the non-traditional companies, again, focusing in bringing in that leading edge uh, technology development, but it also provides provisions for uh, traditional vendors and systems integrators to work with us and work with non-traditionals as well. Um, look, it's going to take uh, all players to modernize the Department of Defense. Next slide. Now, I mentioned this before, uh, but I wanted to put this back up again to show uh, the time uh, involved as well as the approximate number of vendors participating. One of the um, manifestations of a positive uh, work of our commercial engagement team is the fact that we've had about 150 vendors uh, respond to our latest uh, request for proposals. So there's some success there, but the challenge with that is then we have to evaluate those with our DOD partner until we can uh, get them down to a manageable number uh, and then bring them in for uh, in-person pitches. Next slide. Here's a little uh, more detail on that. Uh, as I mentioned before, all of our solicitations start with a DOD uh, partner problem statement we put out on our website, and then we look for companies to submit uh, solution briefs. Once we get all those in, we work with our DOD partner through phase one to evaluate those uh, to make sure that they're relevant to the problem, uh, that it's actually doable as technical merit, uh, and that it's uh, innovative. 
And then we invite a certain number in for uh, in-person pitches for phase two. And we do the final down select after that. And then we look to award and negotiate a prototype uh, contract, uh, considering the, uh, the conditions there on the right side that you can see. Next slide. So some concluding thoughts uh, from DIU's perspective, thinking about uh, emerging technology and how we incorporate that into the way that we fight. Um, look, I think we all recognize that domains competition are no longer exclusively military. Uh, there's an economic element now to this. There's a social element now to that with uh, AI. AI certainly is an emerging technology. And DIU has been one tool in the toolbox to uh, solve these, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and we need to continue to grow that innovative thinking across the department. Um, I mentioned acquisition of form and uh, considering the holistic acquisition system, which includes the requirements process as well as the budgeting process. And we need to continue to drive more funding into more R&D funding into the dual use uh, technology ecosystem. Next slide. For those interested in working with us, you can check out our solicitations uh, on our website. Uh, I think currently we have uh, one out right now in our space portfolio, uh, but do uh, reach out, uh, check in with us. You can sign up for an RSS push so you'll be notified when we do have new solicitations out there. Thank you. And I look forward to questions and answers a little bit later. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, next up is Chris Manuel, director of the Central Coast Tech Bridge, and he's gonna talk a little about what is the Tech Bridge and this one in particular, how is it unique and a uh, project you're working on right on, on talent management. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I, I wanted to give a little background um, on me and kind of uh, so it will make sense of why uh, I, I think we can do a project uh, like this at, uh, at NPS. So uh, my, my background, I'm a, a retired chief warrant officer, just retired uh, in, in um, November of last year. Uh, spent uh, most of my time in special forces uh, on active duty. And then uh, was with the uh, Army Reserve Cyber Protection Brigade uh, as a reservist. Uh, so what brought me to NPS, because I am an NPS alum, is a project um, called uh, Rover. And I uh, was looking at our battle focus analysis of our mission in Iraq and looked at uh, why uh, so many of those missions failed on the surveillance side. What I found was there was an equipment shortfall. Um, so I started looking for uh, ways to get farther away from the target uh, in order to um, complete the mission, provide the resolution that was needed but do it safely. Uh, I didn't find what I was looking for originally, so I started looking in adjacent markets. Um, so when we started this, uh, we talked about what is uh, uh, emerging technology. I would almost have to be one of the people that would vote. It's what's new to the DOD. Because what I settled on was decoupling a system from Predator that allowed us to stand 117 miles off target with very low latency, and um, high enough resolution video to where we can uh, determine operational acts. But that technology, um, you know, when I talked to people at, at JSOC that saw it and looked at it, it was 15, down, 15 years down the road in their roadmap. Yet, because I was their surveillance guy and had to go in and do cave clearance in Iraq, I wanted to be able to see what was on the target. Um, so we were able to quickly come up with something that uh, allowed us to do that. Now, most people would say, okay, well, getting streaming video, low latency video directly down to the guy on the ground would be emerging technology. But that C-band um, um, capability that we use was relatively old. Predator had already been uh, used in the 90s. This was you know, being used uh, 10 years later. So uh, a lot of it depends on how you use the technology. And uh, this is kind of the model that I've used um, for developing technology. And I believe it's something that uh, the US really needs to look at uh, on how we're gonna be able to leap. So the uh, uh, 
I came to MPS to take that 38 pounds of lightweight gear and get it into a smaller form factor uh, as a student. And my student project ended up uh, receiving about 200 million in uh, contracts. And I left uh, active duty and went to a startup. That startup was acquired by Sierra Nevada Corporation. And I uh, finished there as a corporate vice president. Uh, one of the professors at uh, NPS invited me back um, to show other students and professors how to do the same thing that I did. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now as Associate Dean of Research for Technology Development. But part of being able to make these things happen, when I looked back at why I was able to move as quickly as I did uh, on developing a prototype here, a lot of it was the acquisition models that were used. Uh, Big Safari uses a uh, um, an OTA. Uh, JSOC uh, has rapid uh, acquisition methods for doing things that allowed us to get companies on contract quickly. And within a year, we basically developed a system that before cell phones were doing this without infrastructure, did a movie map display, chat, uh, voice over IP, uh, video that linked back to a striker and could send the video anywhere in the world. And we were doing that with a infrastructureless um, uh, network. And that deployed to um, Afghanistan and, and Iraq. So when I came back, uh, I looked at, uh, okay, you've got really uh, innovative students here, professors here, people come up with great ideas. Uh, I'm not unique. Uh, as I tell people all the time, there's probably 500 people like me that show up every cohort. The difference between me and them is uh, one was timing. I was here at a time when uh, we were in Afghanistan and going into Iraq. Um, the technical readiness of the technology, I was able to demonstrate something uh, relatively quickly working with uh, companies and that captured the imagination of uh, the funders which turned it into you know, a much larger contract. Um, the other big part of it was my advisors. I had the right advisors uh, for doing what I was looking at doing at the time. Uh, Dave Netzer, was my um, uh, principal advisor. He was the Dean of Research at the time. And I believe Dave had uh, uh, 38 years uh, time here at NPS. And when I got here said, hey, I'm going to retire. Um, when he um, uh, saw what I was doing, he said, well, there's really no one here that uh, you know, could be a single advisor for you. So he stayed on board uh, for me to not only graduate, but complete the prototype that we were doing. So those are some of the, uh, I would say, key elements for getting something across uh, uh, the valley of death and getting it out. Uh, you've got to have those things line up. Um, another example I'll give of technology that was considered emerging, and I think a lot of people considered a huge success, was how quickly we got to uh, the MRAP. Uh, that V-shaped hole technology is actually based on 1980s um, mine resistant um, vehicle technology developed by the South Africans in, in a vehicle called a Casper. The Namib Namibians had it in the 90s in a vehicle called the Wolf. And then when we went to war and needed it, uh, what looked like, okay, hey, this, this vehicle got developed really quickly and uh, we were able to get it out. So a lot of times with emerging technology, it's not that the technology is new. It's just being used in a different way, or uh, the fact that you have a need and then someone is able to look in those adjacent markets and pull it forward, um, makes it into something that's emerging. As the director of the Central Coast Tech Bridge, uh, what we're looking at is basically Central California extends from LA County all the way up into Silicon Valley. Um, as the Tech Bridge director, what we are charged with is connecting the region uh, better uh, so uh, we can help to solve naval problems. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that uh, uh, technology can get connected into the government. We're really focused on your non-traditionals, uh, universities, uh, small businesses, 
that may have ideas that uh, may not ever get to government. Uh, so we're looking at at those. We're you know one of the projects that uh, we're working on right now, uh, and I'm going to show a slide here, uh, and I think that will give a better representation of what it is. So it is the Talent Education Assessment Management System, Teams. For this particular project, uh, we are doing, uh, the lead for this is the National AI Institute. And we're looking at how to upscale uh, the US government um, at large uh, em employees on emerging technology. Uh, so the system that we're looking at building um, is not, necessarily dependent on AI or using AI, but the, the pilot will focus uh, initially on AI. As quantum starts to, uh, to emerge, we could actually make use that domain. If someone wanted cyber, we can use that domain. Uh, and I'll go through how we're looking at taking this approach. So it starts with a, uh, um, we are looking uh, at universities, a number of universities, um, to look at what is emerging uh, technology. And, and in this case, we're looking at what I would call bleeding edge and leading edge. A lot of people will say well, those are the same definition in my mind, something that is um, bleeding edge. It's much lower technical readiness level. It's something that's emerging. So imagine, uh, you know, if you were looking at a university when deep fakes was first starting to uh, um, to emerge. Someone would have seen that and said, okay, um, this is a technology that can be used for information operations, but it also is a big threat. Identifying that threat and then figuring out what can we do about it uh, in advance and then making recommendations of where uh, funding should go towards if we need to accelerate something. We're also looking at um, emerging talent. So um, on the technology side, we have a partnership intermediary agreement. The uh, uh, tech bridges are using a number of uh, non-FAR uh, capabilities, non-federal acquisition capabilities like uh, PS, uh, other transaction authorities, price challenges. It's not that we won't use uh, the FAR, we will, uh, but part of what the tech bridges were designed to do was to take some of these uh, capabilities that uh, have been around, you know, like Mike said, I think the uh, uh, OTAs have been around since, you know, I think he said the 40s. Um, they're not normally used in day-to-day -day acquisitions within the Department of the Navy. So we are trying to bring, um, and, and that's not true across all of the Navy, but in a number of places it is. So we're trying to make uh, some of these tools a little more um, known and usable for people. So uh, with that, we're, we have a partnership intermediary agreement with an organization called the Academic Venture Exchange. Uh, we also have one with uh, Defense Works. Uh, so that will look at the uh, technology side. On the talent side, Harvard is the lead uh, on that, and they've got uh, about uh, 80 to 90 universities um, they're looking at also uh, community colleges, uh, tech schools, and trying to figure out with the fact that we're going to lose or potentially uh, have a large amount, one third of our workforce uh, get to the retirement age in the next uh, uh, five years, we really need to make sure that, that we can either upscale what we currently have or replace them. Uh, and replace them in a way that the capabilities that they have match where we are going as a, as a government. Um, there is a part on the uh, uh, policy side to where uh, recommendations are going to be made for uh, people with certain skills, so if it's AI skills and you uh, test out to a certain level, much like with language proficiency pay, you would receive something for have showing proficiency in those areas. So we're also uh, planning a competency management system. 
I had talked before about the learning development system that um, uh, we're developing here at the Naval Postgraduate School, and it's based on something called the curated heuristics using a network of knowledge. So chunk, uh, chunk learning is what uh, is being developed, and we're looking at that in the GFD. But for all of that to work, um, we're looking at a common data model that starts initially. And then the solution providers will build to that. So when you talk about um, upscaling the entire US government, uh, there is an assessment tool uh, that you'll need for assessing someone's competency. Um, that assessment tool probably, you know, every agency is not gonna to wanna to use the same thing. So we're using a marketplace model with this to where uh, those who want to participate will use the common data model in order to build uh, and even if they're not selected um, uh, through the solicitation process, they can still participate um, by meeting the criteria and uh, building to the common data model. So with that, uh, we are um, looking at how all of this feeds into a personnel management component that each agency uh, in the government has. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, and I wanted to point out something that I thought was cool about the uh, Central Coast Tech Bridge that Chris shared earlier. Um, it is, if, if I'm recalling correctly, the only tech bridge that's partnered with a university or housed at a university. Chris, is that right? Oh, that's correct. We're, we are, that is unique about us, that we are um, anchored to uh, university. The other tech bridges are anchored to uh, warfare centers. Yep. So I think that must, uh, I think you said that creates some opportunities and some challenges to, to, to pave the path there. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, moving on to our final panelist here, Dr. Jonathan Munn. Um, who will be talking about some of his research on advanced decision analytics, risk management, um, and he can explain it better than I can. <laughs> and I will, I will share your slides. Just let me know when you're ready for that to go up. Sounds good. If you can actually pull it up, it would be great. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, all. Uh, my topic is a little bit different than the previous discussions in that my focus is not uh, on the acquisition policy or acquisition process per se, but the decision analytics that goes into an acquisition, the business case justification, the return on investment, ROI justification, portfolio, project selection and allocation, uh, risk analysis, you know, risk uncertainty simulation to handle all types of uh, unknowns in the future, as well as strategic decision options for things like analysis of alternatives, uh, alternate implementation pathways to hedge your risks. Now, specifically today's discussion is on the acquisition of AI and also potentially into autonomous and emerging technology. The reason I picked the specific topic is there is potential for high risk failures of AI systems and emerging technology acquisitions. So it's critical for the acquisition community to uh, examine new complementary analytical and decision-making approaches to managing the acquisition of these systems. And many of these AI systems, as you can imagine, reside in either large commercial or even early stage, you know, small startups or relatively immature system development companies. You have potentially two guys working in a garage, if you will, which potentially clouds the acquisition process due to their unique business processes when compared to the large defense contractors. So now that we, you know, we all know that defense acquisition is a very highly complicated cater of interrelated processes. But again, specifically my research work and interest is focused on decision analytics within acquisitions. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. To get us grounded, uh, thank you. To get us grounded, let me provide you with my personal two cents of what some of these terminologies mean. We use the term AI a lot, but what is real AI, right? What is ML, machine learning, deep learning, neural network, fuzzy logic, stochastic optimization, all these applications within AI, big data, data science applications. So if you look at the first figure on the top, 
you see that the big circle is all about artificial intelligence or AI. It's a fairly nebulous terminology. Anything that's considered smart could be summarily and you know hastily put into that category. Uh, there really aren't any type of standardization criteria for categorizing something like AI. For example, I personally own a, a smart fridge and there's a specific spot for milk and the spot has a built-in weight scale. And when I remove the weight carton and replace it, the counter increases by one. It knows the size of the carton and in terms of fluid ounces and you know how many times I poured the milk and also the remaining weight. So a very simple calculation will indicate that I am low on milk. The fridge then, this smart AI enabled fridge, then sends me a reminder on my iPhone app, remind me, reminding me to get milk. This is considered AI because it is smart, but the algorithm in this case is pretty simple. And honestly, is really not too complicated, but AI is a great market employee in this case to try to sell this fridge and get a premium for it. You gotta pay an extra $500 or $1,000 for this fridge. Um, next, you have the term artificial neural network or NN. Uh, was specified here. Uh, neural network means the use of technology and software algorithms to mimic the human brain, neurons, if you will, and human thought. The so-called brain neurons are actually nodes and layers um, in computer algorithms called perceptrons, used to perceive things. Or in the case of uh, neural networks, we take external stimulus um, or stimuli and interpret them, deriving certain patterns and making decisions. So think of Skynet in the Terminator movies. Now, of course, that's Hollywood guys, but uh, fundamentally it's based on neural network technology. And then next we have something called machine learning or ML, where this has a direct connection actually to neural networks in that machine learning, deep learning, use multiple layers of perceptrons to detect the patterns in large data sets for the purposes of forecasting and making decisions and prediction. Now, this is where big data comes in. And when I say big data, we typically mean data sets with a million to 100 million data points or, or more per variable. Now, imagine using supercomputers or even quantum computing to review millions of surveillance photos, for example, satellite surveillance, um, to determine which ones might contain, say, an adversary's uh, ammunition bunker, uh, military installation construction, and so forth. The problem is that the current technology is not entirely mature. That's why we call it emerging technology. It's not mature technology. Now, I'm sure you've heard of stories where, you know, there are pictures of turtles that were mistaken for uh, gun turrets and, and so forth. There's just many of these uh, examples. I, to me, I believe we're still decades away from a completely reliable, you know, uh, ubiquitous and powerful algorithm that's efficient, appropriate, accurate, and, and so forth. Um, there's also another terminology called NLP or natural language processing. These are things like Google Home, Amazon Alexa's, the uh, Apple series. They parse sentences into chunks, if you will, of action verbs and nouns. They ignore all the conjunctions, the prepositions, basic adjectives, and so forth. Uh, for example, if you ask for uh, a nice story, it will only tell you a story that's in the database. It doesn't know whether the story is actually nice or not, right, or if it's scary or not. Um, then the NLP will determine and execute the next course of action. Now, in fact, NLP has been considered uh, recently for use in acquisition and procurement proce uh, processes, as you can see in the uh, illustration below. Now, however, at this point in the evolution of technology, we really do not have a fully autonomous AI. So most of these so-called AI require supervision or man in the middle or man in the loop, if you will. Now, for example, you may ask uh, Amazon to show you, you know, fried chicken uh, recipes, and it gives you say 24 different choices. You have to manually select one recipe, manually scroll down, list the, you know, look at the uh, recipe steps or click in a video to watch the uh, cooking process. Now in contrast to me, a fully autonomous AI with no supervision means that it knows today is Thursday and the weather is cold outside. And from the tone of your voice, you sound sick, right? You are home from work because it is not a holiday and you have a dozen meetings scheduled on your calendar. But the fact that you ask for a fried chicken means you have a hankering for chicken and you're hungry. And based on far field voice technology, it knows you're sitting on your couch, lying and relaxing on your couch and your voice cadence is lower than usual. So the AI does a computation and knows that you probably have a cold with an 87.5% certainty. And it will automatically order you know, chicken soup from the nearby restaurant to be delivered with a bottle of Robitussin for your cough. 
because your uh, apparently your medicine cabinet sensors with AI enabled sensors indicate that you have less than one dose left. And with the, you know, in the future with AI robots, you will even do your laundry while you rest, right? So next slide, please. That is what I mean by, uh, you know, more of a fully autonomous AI. We're, you know, years away. Another critical element in terms of, you know, AI technology, uh, technology, uh, you know, emerging technology acquisition is something called trust or trusting the technology and, and trust the use of technology. For example, letting, say, AI handle the reordering of uh, office supplies. If there's a mistake, you know, it over orders a few dozen boxes of paper clips. There's no harm done. Somebody gets yelled at and that's that. Now compare that to an AI taking over an Asia's weapon system on board a Navy vessel without any type of manning or a weaponized autonomous drones or a ballistic missile defense system. If things go wrong, the consequences are dire. Um, so do we really trust AI to make critical decisions? Now this will depend of, of course, you know, mission criticality, lethality of the decision, timing issues. Is there a split second decision that needs to be made? Uh, where humans might be a little bit lower, computer speed is you know a lot faster. Any type of human supervision or man in the middle, man in the loop requirements. Whether the the threat in the decision making process is an open box or a closed black box. So, do you truly trust the AI? Uh, what is the rate of fallibility? What is the consequences of failures, mistakes, and so forth? Now, some prior research I've done in the area includes technology trust in EOD or explosive ordnance disposal technology like the sea otter or sea ox. Uh, the newer versions come with three options, for example, like a, a tethered version where you actually have a wire connected to it, a remote control, um, and fully autonomous. So guess what the EOD Marines who tested these three levels of automation say, right? You can just imagine. Another project was on LMAC or LMACC, the Lightning Manned uh, Autonomous Combat Capability which was based on the Sea Hunter and Sea Strike platforms. Now, should these be fully autonomous or have man in a decision loop, if you will? All these type of new technologies also depends on the organizational structure and culture, right? The decision criticality, the type of AI use, trust in the technology, whether it's a black box, open system, uh, if uh, the decision you know, threat, again, is visible to the operator. The operator knows that these are the steps, the algorithms that the AI goes through before it you know, makes a decision and so forth. And of course, we have the big elephant in the room, which we haven't talked about. This thing, small little problem called cybersecurity threats, right? When you talk about AI. Um, next slide, please. Now, for these past types of research, we approach the decision options from different points of view. We integrate various methodologies within the realms of AI technology for the purposes of uh, doing things like ROI, return on investment, justification of business decisions, find the best implementation path forward and so forth. And at the same time, clearly looking at technology trust factors, risk analysis, risk mitigation, uncertainties in the future and so forth. Um, the approaches that I usually apply include actually, ironically, AI and machine learning methodologies, algorithms to actually test for the AI uh, acquisition. Uh, as well as things like advanced analytics like Monte Carlo simulation, risk-based simulation to model the uncertainties, um, stochastic type forecasting, predictive models, all these you know fancy words that uh, you can use at two o'clock in the morning in a bar and hopefully not get kicked out. Uh, strategic options to determine the analysis of alternatives, the alternate pathways to implementation. You know, there's not just a going from point A to point B, there's not just a single implementation pathway that's uh, optimal. There are many things that could be implemented. That's why we have this thing called, you know, open architecture, we have flexible ships and so forth, because we need to maintain flexibility. Question is how much should you be willing to spend to obtain those flexibility up front as compared to, uh, you know, implementing the changes down the road when you need to make the make course corrections. So for example, having, you know, uh, flexible ships, you know, allows you the ability to, you know, single ship multiple missions, if you will, um, have a, you know, mission bay that you can actually swap out equipment as needed. So you need a tote sonar one moment, you need, uh, you know, delivery humanitarian, uh, you know, mission and so forth another, uh, another week, you can just make the uh, modifications very quickly, as opposed to you have a ship that's pre-built and uh, you may end up having to cut steel, if you will. And that's expensive and it takes a long time for that to be uh, implemented. So. What is the value of actually having flexibility in this case to uh, reduce your risk, as well as, of course, applying these types of, uh, you know, more advanced analytics, we'll say, 
to more traditional program management uh, techniques like earned value management, EVM, knowledge value added, traditional discount cash flows, things like that. Uh, but the only issue in terms of analysis within the DOD environment is that, uh, you know, the ROI in the military environment is a difficult nut to crack because the DOD is not in the business of making money. <laughs> there is no revenue. Uh, foreign military sales is not considered revenue, right? And, and that is like, you know, small decimal points as compared to the uh, annual budget. Um, so getting a true return on investment in terms of revenue is actually intractable. So we have to use alternate metrics, you know, military type metrics. And, you know, that's a whole another discussion that we can get into. Uh, next slide, if you will. Uh, and, and finally, we also look at standardized uh, type costs and schedule risk, you know, cost risk and schedule risk analysis in terms of acquisitions, you know, in terms of uh, program management, cost and schedule risk, uh, the two main things that will actually kill you, of course. Um, and so we typically use uncertainty based stochastic type modeling of cost and schedule. Uh, we don't just use, you know, single point estimates and, and so forth. Now, in previous research that we've done, I've applied uh, ROI, return on investment, decision analysis, you know, business case justification on multiple domains, uh, things like EOIR, electro optical infrared sensors, carry on cryptologic programs, you know, the radars, uh, ROI even on military education and research. What is the ROI of Naval Postgraduate School you know, when uh, a sponsor, you know, has to pay X dollars to send a whole cohort of uh, Marines or Naval officers to NPS? Uh, the LMAC that we talked about. I'm currently working on some 5G protective wavelength with DARPA in terms of search analytics. Is that actually something that we want to do? Do we do open source or do we make this a proprietary type system and so forth? Uh, flexible ship designs with uh, PEO ships and, and so forth. Just like what Admiral Lewis was uh, talking about earlier on, um, you know, we have a lot of these work done and it is more for in terms of justification of uh, implementation, if you will. Now, many of these research projects were done with MPS graduate students, um, mostly junior to mid-level type officers at this point, working on their master's and PhD uh, degrees. So that's where I teach in the, in the doctoral program. So um, thank you. I, I think my time is up. Uh, thanks for your attention. I will yield the floor back to the host for uh, the next steps. All right, thank you. Um, and Jonathan, I wanted to ask you a follow up. Um, you're talking about ROI. In my understanding of how you've talked about it, either today or in, in stuff that we've seen previously, some of those analytics would kind of help DOD or program managers figure out if they should develop or, or field products, right? That, that is the idea. I mean, I, ROI is just one point of view, right? That's, that's also the strategic point of view, you know, the tip of the spear, what the commanders, you know, in the field actually feel like, uh, what OFMAF ones, for example, you know, OSD and so forth. So it depends on various stakeholders. Um, and we can actually do ROIs based on multiple points of view as well. And the ROI does not necessarily have to be economic, it could be non-financial uh, in nature. So do you think um, the average uh, program manager or decision maker would be able to use these tools or would need, you know, help of an expert like you? Uh, hopefully, with all the students that we're training, you know, we, this will proliferate. I mean, in terms of methodology. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. But uh, I'm always available. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. You're going to get some phone calls, I think. <laughs> um, pardon me while I move my computer around. Uh, if we can have our other panelists come back on screen. And we'll see where we are with our um, questions that have been posed from the audience. Um, so at the top here, I have a question for, uh, this is from Mike McGrath and it's posed for Dave Lewis, but I think um, quite frankly, all of you could probably talk about this. But the question is, since requirements are uncertain and changeable, what role should JSIDs play in the acquisition and budget processes in DOD? Um, so Dave, we'll start with you. And then if others want to chime in on kind of the issue of, of how we generate requirements. Okay. Um, I have two examples in mind. The uh, Danish frigate program I mentioned earlier, uh, they levied a requirement that all combat systems upgrades, all ship uh, weapons and communications upgrades had to happen, be completed within 90 days. 
and, and the point was they have a small Navy, they don't have very many ships and they can't afford to have ships laid up for a year, 18 months, cutting metal like uh, Dr. Mon talked about. Um, and uh, so they levied a requirement to, to do that quickly. That drove them to what was called at the time a client server architecture. We would call that cloud architecture today. And they meet that. Uh, what takes us a year or 18 months, uh, a major uh, combat systems upgrade, the Danes do in 90 days. And, and it's done partly by descoping. You know, you do, you do what you can do in 90 days. But a lot of it is because when they do the upgrade, they just walk into the data centers, yank all the servers out, put new servers in that already have preloaded code, and turn it on. And, uh, and then they do the ship unique testing. Uh, second example is a uh, missile defense agency when they were doing phased adaptive approach in Europe. Uh, the, uh, the army general in charge at the time wanted to be able to remove the systems quickly. So he levied a requirement that they had to be removable within a certain period of time, short. I don't remember if the number was classified, so I won't say what it is. And, uh, and that caused the Aegis system, uh, which is the phased adaptive approach, to be redesigned to be modular uh, so that it could be quickly removed from a building. Uh, it turned out that had some real advantages in terms of installation. It had some real advantages in terms of cost, and it had some real advantages in terms of maintenance and accessibility uh, for the buildings that had the radar in it. So, so I think uh, to answer your question is, uh, I think the requirements right now deal with a point, uh, a point war fighting need. I need to shoot this missile, it goes this far and shoot that target. Uh, and what we don't consider is the time of the service life of the ship. So I need to have spy six on my ship. Okay, that's great. What about spy seven? What about spy eight? I mean, we've had five versions of the, of the uh, Aegis radar in the life of the program, which is a new radar about every eight years. And there have been 10 baselines, which is a new baseline every four years. Well, that's not written in a requirement anywhere today. And I think it should be that, okay, you're gonna put a ship out, you need to be able to replace the radar every eight years. That's our history. Uh, well, that changes how the radar is put in the ship. It changes how the radar is designed. And, uh, and, and that then allows uh, uh, flexibility and adaptability later on, uh, and you're not locked into a particular system. I'll give you a good example. Early aircraft carriers, one of the early British aircraft carriers had elevators, you know, the flight deck on top, uh, hangar deck below. The elevator was shaped like an airplane, which makes perfect sense in 1922, but then the airplane changed. You know, it doesn't work anymore. So they did what seemed good at the time. I got this airplane, I need to put it down. I want to minimize the impact of the ship. So it was shaped like a T and, uh, and that didn't work. And then they had to bend metal and cut things in order to make a, a rectangular elevator to fit any airplane. And that gets back to the interface, over. <laughs> Um, awesome. I love the examples that, that Dave Lewis has in his head. It's a, it's a robust history. Um, Mike, I want to kick it over to you because you talked about um, the kind of the DIU model uses problem statements as opposed to hard requirements. So maybe you think about you know, answering this question in the terms of that. When should we use problem statements versus hard requirements that go through the JSITS process? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, exactly right. We use uh, problem statements, but backing it up a little bit, um, I think the key is the modular uh, open system architecture and truly be modular open system architecture. So you can plug and play and start matching commercial cycles with software. You know, in the department, we get uh, software and we hold on to it for so long that it's generations behind what the commercial sector is kicking out. We're starting to change that. Now you hear, you're talking about a software color of money um, and you hear about uh, DevOps where they're creating software uh, with the end user sitting right next to them and then pushing out code almost daily, um, which was unheard of uh, in recent history. So I think modular open system architecture is an absolute critical uh, part to solve that. Um, but look, we we buy things the same way. And again, this is a, an oversimplification. We buy uh, aircraft carriers the same way that we buy pallets of copier paper. A, a slight uh, exaggeration to make my point, but at some point there's a line in that continuum to, to delineate between those things that where we need a 30-year plan on 
and those things that we just need to go out and buy the best value uh, off the shelf, um, no matter what it is. And an example I'll use is um, oh, broadly um, start to shift once we once we decide where that line is on that continuum. Start to shift uh, and understand that we can allow industry uh, to define the solutions. And the example I'll give is a communications device. So. Um, we had a DoD partner come to us with uh, the challenges of their communication. Um, and the problem statement was uh, the challenges of communicating in the fog and friction of wartime situations. And we also, uh, we eventually um, uh, worked to include things like humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in that as well, because we prototyped this uh, communication device in uh, hurricane uh, rescues, uh, as well as some downrange uh, prototyping. And what it was, you know, our, our, our DoD partner wanted to come to us with, you know, describing the thickness of the ear pad covering the ear to increase insulation or or defining uh, noise canceling on very specific frequencies. And, and we kept having to get away from that and say, you know, what, let's get back to what is the problem you're trying to solve? So we got that that problem statement. We put that out to industry and we were awarded a contract to a company called Sonatis that created what's now commonly called the molar mic. And there's been some stories about it. And they generated, they created a, it was actually a, a Bluetooth a, a hearing aid company using Bluetooth technology, believe it or not. And talking to the leadership, they said, never in a million years did we see ourselves as a defense contractor, and yet here they are uh, making communication devices. And what it is, is a, a radio transmitter receiver that fits on the back tooth, uses the facial bones for amplification, et cetera. And like I said, we prototyped it underneath helicopters in hurricane uh, relief efforts and prototyped it in Afghanistan and Iraq in uh, those kind of uh, ambient wartime noises uh, that one would encounter. And it, it passed and we wound up uh, putting it on a production contract and uh, uh, the DOD partner purchased um, uh, millions of dollars worth of those. But again, getting back to, you know, what, what is the specific pro problem we're trying to solve? I'm not saying that we need to get rid of the requirements process, but but tweak it a little bit to understand that we don't have to over describe and define uh, all the pieces of it, recognizing that the commercial sector um, has a lot of solutions. We just need to figure out how to apply some minor customization, prove it through prototyping, uh, and then move forward in that way. And again, I can't be at that with for those items that are on the left of that continuum uh, that we know that there's a, a commercial solution for. No one's making a uh, Virginia class submarine in the commercial sector uh, or a uh, an aircraft here in the commercial sector that we can go uh, go purchase off the shelf. Uh, yeah, at least not in the American commercial sector. Um, Chris or Jonathan, do you want to chime in on the issue of requirements? Sure. I, I'm just actually going to follow up with what uh, Admiral Lewis was saying. Um, I can't, uh, from the top of my head, come up with a list of items. I have to look at my the list that I have in one of my papers. So Stenflex, for example, Mako, modular platform concepts, uh, you know, Royal Danish Navy with the Flex, I can't even pronounce, Vexvitskin class <laughs> type ships, the Absalon class. Uh, we have the Ivor, you know, frigate. For example, German Navy does that a lot, right? With NACO ships in terms of uh, open architecture and uh, flexible ships. French Navy, the Equantine class, um, Italian Navy as well, even the Royal Australian Navy looking at uh, future frigates uh, with mandatory design characteristics as flexible. So keep your options open, in other words, right? Have some flexibility. There is value in flexibility in the future, keeping options open. And in fact, um, NAFC has this concept of flexible ships and they come up with a five pillar, if you will. Uh, the first pillar was like you decouple your payloads from your platforms. So your payloads would be your capabilities, platforms would be a ship, right? So the ship is actually an Uber, <laughs> if you will, in the ocean and you can carry whatever it is as long as you decouple. Uh, the second requirement is that you have standardized platform to payload interfaces. So in other words, if you know anything, you know, if you use a computer as a USB, right? USB can be plugged, you can plug anything into a USB, so standardized um, interfaces. Um, the third is rapid reconfiguration. So specific C5i, for example, compartments that can be easily reconfigured with upgraded equipment and new systems. You don't have to end up cutting steel. Um, fourth would be pre-planned access routes. So it's for easy removal, replacement of interior equipment and systems and so forth. Uh, one you know, thing that you can think of is like the canes, right? The consolidated float network uh, you know, system. Big problems, right? <laughs> you can't fit, you know, you need that two additional inches to actually move your servers out of the room. Um, that would be a problem unless you have pre-planned access routes. And then fifth, you have sufficient service life allowance. So growth margins. 
So have the ability, the space and the weight for future capabilities. So, you know, provision for say things like uh, projected demand for distributed systems, you know, things like electric power, cooling, network bandwidth and so forth. So if you're looking at directed high, you know, powered high energy type weapons in the future, if you don't have the electrical power to actually support it or actually have the flexibility to add that in the future, um, you're limiting yourself in this case. So if anybody's interested, happy to you know, share a couple of the, art the articles that we have uh, with the ARP. Actually, it's written for the ARP itself. So that's a plug. <laughs> well done, well done. Uh, and Chris? So Michelle, the only thing I was gonna add is we're using a statement of objectives. And as uh, Mike had mentioned earlier, uh, sending this out and letting uh, industry come back and tell us what is in the realm of the possible. So we let them plan unconstrained. Um, so some of the things that came in were off target, but it was for us to uh, to sift through those and find the nuggets that were really good ideas that we just couldn't think of. And um, you know, sometimes I think when people write a statement of work or a statement of requirements that they are limited to um, the things that they know or their team knows. Um, so we use a statement of objective to allow it to be a little more open uh, on the responses and then provide a statement of work uh, after we uh, got their responses. Yeah, excellent. I, I, I love the, the way we're letting industry talk back to us as opposed to prescribing requirements. Um, speaking of, I'm going to hop over to the chat here. Um, our Katie Godin kind of posted a comment in the chat, and even though it's in the chat, not the q and I'll allow it. Uh, it seems kind of to, to continue this conversation of, um, you know, being able to get these things depends on a, a company having access to government portals, right, and knowing where to go to, to, to find, these, find these postings. Um, so I'm just kind of kind of paraphrase. Um, especially for dual use emerging technologies, uh, like how much scouting is, is DOD doing? And I know, um, especially for Chris and Mike, you know, that's, that's part of the mission of your organization. So like going out to industry as opposed to expecting them to come to SAM.gov or whatever platform um, you're posting your, your SOOs or your, your you know, you know, problem statements on. So, so how, how, do you, how do you go out and find industry if industry doesn't come to you? For DIU, uh, like I indicated, we developed a team within DIU specifically focused on this, our commercial engagement team uh, that is out uh, in the ecosystem, uh, working with venture capital, uh, working with uh, the C-suites and uh, keeping a finger on the pulse of where the investment is taking place, where the development is taking place and making sure those folks are aware of our uh, solicitations when we do push them out. Uh, we push them out on our website. Uh, like I said, we have RSS pushes where folks can sign up to get notified. We push them out on social media, uh, pretty good uh, blanking. And like I said, our last two, uh, I think AI and autonomy uh, solicitations, we had over 150 uh, vendors uh, submit for each one of those. Um, and like I, I also alluded to, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's great to get that many. Uh, that just increases the, the workload of our PMs and uh, DOD partners to cool those down. But happy to have that Happy to have that problem because it also indicates to me that regardless of some of the things we've seen uh, in the press recently about uh, the tech ecosystem not wanting to work with government, uh, that, that has not been our experience at all. In fact, they, we found that uh, by and large uh, tech companies, uh, entrepreneurs want to work uh, with the department. Uh, so we have not uh, we've not come across that, but we're always looking for other ways uh, and other ideas to uh, make sure that we're casting a wide enough net and getting that leading edge technology. We've been accused of focusing on the coast, uh, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Boston, uh, but we actually uh, look across the country. Uh, we have a, an office in Austin, and we're looking at a Midwest. Uh, you know what the Midwest tech ecosystem doing? There's a lot of venture capital uh, moving to Chicago. A lot of uh, things taking place at uh, universities across the Midwest. Wichita State has actually has a an F-35 on site that they are using uh, to develop a lot of uh, advanced technologies and emerging technologies. So it's not something I, I realized a lot. I went out and talked to some folks. So always looking at ways to make sure we're casting a wide enough net to get the best technology that America has to offer. So Michelle, for the tech bridge, uh, we're a relatively um, say, mature tech bridge compared to some of the others. 
Uh, so I'll talk about how Naval X is doing it in uh, paths that we're looking at following. Um, uh, so there are a number of events um, uh, that we will have to where we'll reach out to uh, schools or different places. And remember, we're really looking for the non-traditionals. We're not going to go to a Boeing or uh, one of those organizations, um, you know, unless they just have something unique that they come to us for, which is kind of would be kind of unusual. If they did. Um, but um, the Academic Venture Exchange, I talked about a little bit about them earlier. We have a, an agreement with them and they have 34 of the top uh, research universities. Um, so 83% of what is coming out of the universities are coming out of those top uh, 34 schools. They are looking at, at expanding that. Uh, so we do use them as a network and we already have a partnership with them. Uh, with Defense Works, they have uh, over uh, 70,000 connections with companies uh, where we're able to get information out through that network. Uh, we also have a relationship with the AFWorks uh, network. Uh, another uh, um, network that we use is um, the uh, SBIR, STTR uh, program offices. So you've got the Naval uh, program office or, uh, that has uh, uh, 500,000, uh, 500 million per year um, in funds that they put towards um, uh, SBIRs and STTRs. Uh, they have a database that we're able to look at when we're looking for a specific tech. Uh, and then we will also have pitch events, local pitch events. So there's a, uh, a 501c3 uh, nonprofit uh, called the uh, um, uh, DART, um, and, and I'm trying to think, of, it's drone uh, automation, robotics, technology. Uh, they are um, like right down the street. So we are uh, doing a, we're connecting with uh, Ensign to do a pitch event uh, for them in their upcoming um, uh, conference. So what, what we are doing is relatively uh, small. Again, that's where we're, that's where we're supposed to live. We're supposed to find uh, those gems and jewels that uh, will really help to solve uh, naval problems with non-traditionals. And that, those are the places where we're looking at connecting. Great, thanks. Um, since you, so you mentioned um, Cibber, um, question from Major Jason Crosby, and this is for Mike says a lot of what you're doing seems similar to the Air Force Ventures new Cibber process, quicker timelines, non-traditional companies. Are you familiar? And uh, if so, how do you differ? Do you collaborate with them? No. Anything else about that? Jason, thanks for the question. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, uh, very familiar with AppWorks um, and their Cibber process. We are uh, different. Uh, they are primarily working uh, to solve Air Force problems. We work across the joint force, but we do work closely with them. Uh, we've worked on a couple of different projects that uh, we developed and then passed off to AppWorks to continue, uh, to continue developing. It was an EVTOL program uh, that we call EVTOL. Uh, we have a range out in um, Silicon Valley and we were able to um, prototype uh, EVTOL vehicles uh, for battlefield movement out on our range and, and uh, uh, then cull that down and then pass that off to uh, the Air Force. So we do work closely uh, with AFWERCs. Uh, in fact, we have a bi-weekly sync with the AFWERCs leadership, Nate Dillard uh, over there, uh, Jason uh, Ratchi also. Uh, so um, we are aware we do work with them. We don't use cyber dollars. Um, we use uh, appropriated dollars or we use our DOD partners, uh, RDT and E funds. And that represents recurring revenue to a lot of the companies that we work with uh, and, and uh, puts us in a positive relationship with uh, venture capital as well, because they see us as, as de-risking and uh, signaling from the department on the technologies uh, of particular interest to the department. Awesome, thanks. Um, I'm gonna move on to a question from Ron Cole, who asks a, a fun question about kind of about the nature of emerging technologies. Can you shed some light on how to decide to back off or even abandon a current hot emerging technology because some hotter emerging tech is emerging? So whoever wants to go after that one. I would love to take that one if I could take a shot in the dark. Uh, that's what strategic flexibility is all about. Strategic options, having decision options uh, where you can 
you know, going from point A to point B, point B being the future, and there's a lot of uncertainties, right? We don't know what's going to happen three years, five years in the future, what the, uh, you know, domain looks like, what the, uh, I mean, the, the architecture looks like, what the AI, you know, situation looks like in the future. But um, you, you need to be able to buy options, if you will, to have that flexibility, make the course correction, make a right, make a left. When the uncertainty becomes resolved over the passage of, time action events. Over time, you see a new technology coming out, action, you're actually doing some research development, you're doing some testing, you, and, and so forth. Um, and events that actually occur, we can't even, you know, consider or fathom, you know, years ago, like for example, COVID-19, right? So uh, if you implement things like options to wait, options to execute, abandonment type, type options, uh, abandonment options like an exit salvage, cut your losses, a T4C, a termination for convenience. If you actually put it in there, you can stop before executing the next phase. You can do an option to wait. An option to wait is like an LRIP, uh, low rate initial production, R&D, ATD, prototyping, all those things, right of first refusal. So you have the ability to put a little bit of money in, you know, see how it works prior to actually making the decision to actually jump in. But you have the right of first refusal. You can, you know, they can't go anywhere else, if you will. Um, you can apply this to, you know, things like expansion options, platform technology. So typically, certain types of new platforms, the uh, valuation is, is relatively low. It's not as profitable. But future add-ons tend, you know, phase two, phase three type uh, ACTD follow-ons and so forth, reusability, scalability, right? So those things actually provide value. Um, contraction options. So some type of a joint inter-service venture, maybe some outsourcing alliances, uh, foreign partnerships, uh, compound options where you can do simultaneously looking at three or four of these at the same time, depending again on budget and so forth. So if you implement some of these stopgap, you know, type uh, decision, you know, um, I would say thresholds or milestones, if you will, um, that allows you a lot more flexibility. So rather than have everything pre-baked in, you know, upfront for years and years into the future. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, yeah, I think that's where, um, where our current process probably hurts us the most is you know, with, uh, with uh, JSIDs and the PPBE, we decide years in advance what we're going to do. And, and that's not particularly flexible or responsive if we're going down a technology thread and, it, and it, it's a dot. Uh, it's hard for us to back out and change course uh, quickly. Uh, and, and I think there's a perception that technology is deterministic, that you know, things move one, two, three, four, you know, six, one, six, two, six, three, six, four, and then you build it. Well, that's not at all how it works. That's how we have articulated it, but that's not the way it works in real, in real life. So Aegis, you know, uh, huge system, great for the, for the fleet, everything. That was the fourth time the Navy had tried to do phased array radars. Fail, 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 fail. And then finally with Aegis, it succeeded because the Yuk-7 computer came out, UYK-7, and it had just enough computing power to be able to handle the, the processing for an integrated air defense system. And signal processing uh, had advanced far enough that the radar uh, uh, dwells could be manipulated, digitized, and, and, and then the computer was able to do the, uh, the signal processing. But that was at the hairy edge of what was possible in 1968, 1970. But we had failed multiple times before that, uh, three times in the 1960s. So uh, the Enterprise in Long Beach, remember, came out with a phased array radar, failed. And then it was a short program called Typhoon, which was a lensing system that failed. And then immediately, Aegis came along uh, and that succeeded just barely. And then it has obviously progressed uh, fairly deterministically since then. Uh, if that were to happen today, I would, I, we would be the department would be challenged to change courses three times in less than a decade uh, to develop what turned out to be the world's premier, uh, not only fleet defense system, but I think ballistic defense system uh, in the world. And, uh, and so your, your question is a good one. And that's where just acquisition flexibility isn't adequate, I don't think. I think we have to have the ability to move fast in the requirements world 
be less specific, probably like the earlier question, and then uh, and then really need to uh, look at what's happening in the budgeting world. I think the new uh, the pilot for software acquisition is is I'm, I'm really zeroed in on that because that's the first time we've cracked the door open that we can move fast in software and and not be and not be uh, I'm looking for the right word uh, handcuffed by the mechanics of this kind of money or that kind of money and you know, our financial system thinks you invent something you build it and you sustain it and that applies to like tanks and ships but it does not apply to most of the stuff we've been talking about today uh, certainly not software certainly not computers certainly not cloud and edge processing certainly not ai uh, as, as everybody's pointed out so but the money falls into those categories. And then we end up in these Byzantine arguments about is that sustainment or is that inventing? And then lawyers get involved and everybody runs for the hills. So, so uh, I think we are in need. The environment we had in the 1960s and 70s, the system we developed exactly worked in that environment. Today, we are in a different environment and the rules are different. And uh, I think uh, Secretary Gertz once pointed out, we grew up playing football and now it's soccer, but we're still playing football. And, uh, and soccer is not football. It's not that football is bad or anything. It's just not like that anymore. It's different now. And, and we need to acknowledge that. And, and we can't use our football processes in a soccer game. I use the example of rugby just because it's, I view acquisition as a full contact sport, and, uh, <laughs> which is more like rugby. <laughs> there's, so, a, there's a lot fewer so, timeouts in soccer than there are in football. So I think it's true. And, uh, <laughs> but it's, anyway, the, the analogy either way is, is I think, very good. We built a system in a world where we were playing football. Uh, the Soviets are a lot like us, and we knew what they knew, and they would do what we knew. And you know, it was, and um, and we built a system that worked well in that environment. Uh, and and we could predict twenty five years in the future, and we'd be kind of right. Uh, today, I challenge anybody here to predict Tuesday, uh, much less twenty twenty two or twenty three. But we are still carrying our football rules with us, and and I think places like DIU and uh, TechBridge and Naval IX are starting to break those, or at least identify where the breakage needs to be. And uh, starting with software is good. I think starting commercial is good, uh, but that to me is a starting place, not an ending place. That's that's not a happy place to be. It's a first step. In, in a, a more profound set of changes, I think. And, and uh, you look back at the 50s, before there was any of those things in the early 60s, we moved pretty fast. I mean, there are some very innovative things, the, the nuclear power for submarines, Polaris missile program, Minuteman program, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that the services did was like, wow, that is fast and, and very agile. And then we've lost that. And, and we need to get back to that because uh, we, we, we've done that well in the past and, and we can do it well in the future, I think. Over. So I want to, to add to, uh, uh, to your comments about football or playing football versus soccer. Um, we have a question here from our, our own Bob Mortlock, our principal investigator here at ARP, who is a fan of the defense acquisition system. Um, so he says, isn't the big A defense acquisition, acquisition system to include requirements resourcing and the, the now adaptive acquisition framework technology agnostic? The system is flexible and tailorable. And if we provide industry the ability to innovate, industry will select the emerging technology to meet the end state. The goal should not to be a should not be to acquire AI, AM or 3D printing, autonomy, et cetera, per se, but rather to encourage our industry partners through contracts to integrate these emerging technologies into the next generation of war fighting systems. So there's kind of a lot in there, but, but thoughts on the, the nature of the current acquisition system as, as doing what we need it to do. I'll jump on this one initially. So I don't, I don't necessarily think it is. I mean, the 50 year old PPBE process, which is part of the, the big A defense acquisition system 
um, is ill-suited to leverage the emerging technology now. In fact, I'll give an example. We had a, uh, a prototype, uh, successful prototype um, transition plan with the DoD partner uh, into their, their palm planning in the out years um, on schedule. The prototype finished early, um, six months early, and it then became out of, out of phase of the PPBE process by 12 to 18 months. Uh, the technology becomes stale. Um, the commercial partner becomes frustrated, uh, has to let uh, the workforce go, et cetera. Uh, and so it, it starts to create that, uh, that risk. So I think that that, uh, that part of the process is, is not well suited now. Now, the, the good side to that is there's increasing energy uh, on the Hill uh, that we need to take a look at that and, and uh, you know, maybe do some reform or change some things, much the same way that they took up um, acquisition reform uh, you know, five, 10 years ago. Uh, and the requirements process, again, um, uh, I mentioned that before. I think that, uh, you know, if we think about uh, procurement on a scale and somewhere along there, um, we, we leave it to uh, industry to come up with a solution when we tell them the problem that we're trying to, to solve and go from there. So um, I don't think, um, I, I don't remember what the, the specific words that uh, were in the question, uh, but I think that uh, the we, we need to we need to adjust the system now to reflect where we are. I love the football soccer analogy. I've never had that. I'm going to steal that, but I will cite appropriately, uh, as I've learned from my professors at uh, NPS to uh, to cite appropriately. Uh, I will do that. But um, that is such a great analogy that you're still on the field, you're still playing sport. Uh, your your adversaries are playing a faster, different game with different equipment. Um, uh, or a slower game with different equipment, depending, but, but it, it's just, uh, it's just not, we're just not matching what's out there. Over. Awesome. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Actually, I'll add, I'll add a couple more, a couple more thoughts to that. So, um, you know, we're in competition with a, a centrally planned economy where uh, it can be directed that the commercial sector will work with uh, the Ministry of Defense and provide that technology immediately. Um, that's not our system. We don't want that system. We, we want to keep the open system. It's proven that we can get the best technologists, the best technology uh, by doing that. Uh, but we just have to, to adjust to be able to, uh, to align the commercial, the commercial cycles with the, uh, the defense cycles. Over. Yeah, perfect. And that, that kind of intersects with, with the question. You can decide if there, there's more to say about that. But you know, we've all heard this, heard this talking point that China, as our, as our major competitor, is surpassing us. Um, and I think there's been some interesting uh, sound bites out recently, whether that is or is not the case, or you know it's almost about to happen or it is happening. Um, but but Rob Nethercott um, asked, how do you view our industrial base and military regaining the military edge over China in the future? Uh, also, how long do you think it would take us looking at how we update our platforms now? Um, any any thoughts from you guys about kind of looking looking at the lens of strategic composition or competition? Okay, I'll jump in on that. Uh, read, read a book recently, looked it up here a minute ago, Atlas of AI, uh, written by, it's kind of a counterpoint to the wonderfulness of AI. And, uh, and, and she dwells on a couple of point, uh, points that Dr. Mon mentioned. Uh, she talks a lot about fake AI. It, it, it says it's AI, but there's a person hiding back in there somewhere. Uh, and uh, she talks about, uh, um, how AI gets trained, if it's trained on a specific set of information, it can be deeply flawed when it looks at something different. Uh, she gives a good example. Facial recognition was originally trained on photographs of prisoners in federal penitentiaries. So that, that biases you to a certain population of people, uh, which is not necessarily the general public, and uh, and she uses she uses that thread. So, so I think for officers and senior and civilians, government civilians, understanding a lot of what uh, Jonathan was talking about is critical. That someone comes to you and says, "Hey, the AI says the the ship at 100 miles is a you know a Chinese aircraft carrier, and we need to shoot it." Well. What AI is that? You know, when was that developed? How was it trained? You know, the, 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 the military officer needs to understand that to use that in an operational environment. Um, I think 
I suspect that what we hear out of China is a lot of uh, probably PR and, uh, and overselling. Uh, I would not say that uh, they're better than us in AI. I, uh, I think we're pretty good at it. Uh, I'd say at least half of my re reading is, is generated by Amazon with their AI based on what I buy, and it's pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure the Chinese have anything like that. Uh, and uh, uh, so I would not concede that Chinese AI is better than ours. Uh, I'd start with that. Uh, they have a different society and they have a different view of the world and, and, than we do. And, uh, and I suspect their AI probably comports with their view of, of things, which is not a Western view. Um, and, uh, but I think for the military, uh, you know, having that education that, that uh, Jonathan talked about, educated officers, educated user community, if you will, war fighters, is important. Uh, and I think uh, having program managers and acquisitors, if you will, that, that understand the differences between tanks and AI hardware and software and, and that kind of stuff matters a lot. So I would agree with Bob on his comments, but I, I, I think we there are good procedures and policies. Risk management is kind of risk management. Options analysis is option analysis, but you need to know those are there and you need to know how to use them. And you need to know when to apply them. And there are times when you don't do that. Uh, or then there are times you got to check like six times. You know, system engineering is real. It's important. Apple does system engineering. Cisco does system engineering. They have, they have uh, you know, PDRs and CDRs and milestones and tech reviews and all that stuff. That's all important. But they do it in 18 months. We do it in 10 years. Uh, and that's probably a, a, an important difference. And I think they waterfall their project. So, so they're working on maybe four releases all at the same time and they come out every year or every six months, but they don't stop and then start like we do. They're doing one and they're also starting the other one. They're also starting the other one and they're also doing preliminary work on the, on the fourth one. So they come out like it's every, every 18 months. But if you go back, if you peel the onion back a little bit, Mike knows this, what you see is legitimate system engineering and legitimate engineering and program management and financial management happens. It's just not like we do it. It's it's more overlapping where we do it more serial. And, uh, and, and I think that's the issue with PPBE and, and some of that is it's designed to, to build a tank and field it and invent a tank and build that and field it. And, it. and it doesn't have a process where you could be working on four tanks all at the same time. And then one comes out and another one comes out and another one comes out or they're you know, versions of each other. We, we struggle with that part of it. And I think the commercial world does that very, very well. And we should learn from that. Cool, thank you. Um, I wanna throw a couple of questions from Bruce Naj out there. He is uh, he's one of our friends in the ARP communities so, uh, you know, spoken at our events and, and published research. Um, and kind of two questions, although they're, they're different, I just wanna get both of them out there. One kind of is following up with this idea about AI. Um, uh, he asked, do you feel that, that artificial intelligence as a phrase is quite misleading? Um, it kind of clarifies over in the chat there, um, a misunderstanding is, might lead to a limiting emergence of the new technology. Um, and if so, kind of, you know, th thoughts on that. And then his, uh, you know, unrelated, but just to throw it out there in the, in the back of everyone's mind is, is the question of open system architecture and cyber assurance seeming to conflict. Um, so, Either one of those, if you want to continue the conversation about AI, what it is, how we understand its function and, and its, its applicability, or coming back to the idea of open system architecture as being something crucial to, uh, to flexibility and adaptability um, in the challenge of cyber assurance. Um, so anyone want to jump in on that? Well, I'll start with the AI. Uh, I was in industry when uh, cyber was emerging and all the IT companies became cyber companies. Uh, a, a lot of what uh, um, you will see uh, and what I've been seeing with AI, um, some of the technology that people are presenting to us is automation and they've, uh, you know, remarketed it uh, uh, as, you know, this is artificial intelligence. So I, I do think having the government having a good understanding of what AI is 
uh, program managers, acquisition people, truly understanding what it is and what the difference is uh, will definitely help us uh, when it comes down to selecting uh, capabilities. Um, you know, I, I, I am not an AI expert, um, but I work with people who are, uh, and they will point those things out to me of, you know, I'll say, hey, this is, this is really cool. And it's like, well, Chris, that's just automation. Yes, it is cool, but it's not uh, machine learning. It's not artificial intelligence. So, so I think that us understanding the distinction is important. I, I agree. Actually, uh, we need standardization, but we don't have that currently. So in specific to the question was saying categorization or like functional forms and stuff, you know, we're getting a little technical there, but uh, my short answer is 90% of all the AI type algorithms are based on traditional methodologies. It is just cleaned up, repackaged and relabeled. So it's a lot of marketing around it, if you will. So, in you know, simple example, you were talking about classifications, uh, SVMs. You know, I hate I apologize for the technical terms, but uh, structural vector machines. You know, you're looking at bagging. It's all all these things are cluster K neighbor. You know, methodologies. Those are cluster technologies, uh, clustering segmentation, which has been around for like 40 years, 50 years, even longer, if you will. You know, that you can actually calculate a lot of these things with a pen and pencil without even a computer. The difference now is we repackage the, the process of which you are typically, you know, folks will go through five steps or 10 steps. Now the whole entire process happens to be repackaged. That's all. And all you need to do is feed it initial data to do the training and then the testing, you know, results actually comes out. So I would say, don't quote me on this, but about 90% of the algorithmic uh, approaches I've seen out there pertaining to quantitative, you know, methods. I'm not talking about like, you know, uh, language processing or other type of AI stuff uh, that may exist. Um, but in terms of analytical, you know, quantitative piece points of view, I would say significant portion of it are based on traditional methods. So it is a misnomer, big time. Chris, you were talking about your, your team's project as talent management and is, is part of that um, getting the acquisition workforce kind of up to speed on some of this terminology and understanding what AI really is and what these capabilities really are so that they can acquire it better? The, the pilot is not. Uh, we're really focused on um, assessing uh, where the government workforce is and what is needed, what the gaps are uh, for artificial intelligence. But the knowledge domain uh, moving towards the acquisition professionals. We've already had people inquire, can you do this for acquisition professionals? Can you do this for medical professionals, uh, cyber community? And what, what we feel like we're building with the system is something that uh, you can take a domain out and put another domain in and use uh, the chunk methodology to upscale uh, learning and all of it um, we, we feel like the systems approach that we're using will really change the way that we train and educate across all emerging technologies. Um, and it won't just uh, focus on uh, an engineer, it will focus on the manager, it'll focus on the engineer, it'll focus on the user, um, uh, because uh, uh, again, the approach will allow us to um, change the, the domain and assess in a way that it focuses on uh, the particular user. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm excited to see all of that come online. And I know that's a, that's a recognized challenge. So it's nice to see momentum moving in that direction. Um, I'm gonna throw out Bruce's uh, question about open system architecture and cyber assurance seeming to conflict. Any, any thoughts on that? If it is a conflict or if it's not, and if it is, um, how would you deal with that? Okay, I'll jump in there. Um, I think the commercial world is being attacked more frequently and in more a variety of ways. And from what I have seen in the open source material, I, I, um, I would say that uh, 
the, that community is moving pretty quickly to make their systems more secure, either in software only or in, uh, in, in hardware systems that enable uh, cybersecurity is inherent in the hardware itself. I mean, uh, I think the iPhone, uh, in, in its uh, at least last time I looked at it, which is a few years ago, uh, did some inherently hard, hardware things that normally we'd be done in software, which kind of negated a, a whole bunch of attacks, you know, turning data into code and stuff like that, because it tagged every piece of information, whether it was data or code. And so you couldn't run data as code, which is a was an original hacking technique. I think hyper-converged infrastructure, haven't looked at in a while, and that does kind of the same thing, that, that it builds untrusted processes and there's a lot of hardware trust verification going on behind the scenes of the, of the software. So, so I think a lot of that, which was originally kind of procedural or, or cyber hygiene stuff is, is going into software as it's being written. And I think that's migrating down even into hardware so that it's checking at hardware speeds, not at software or, or depending on a user to be aware, which clearly is not a winning proposition. Um, and then I think I was heavily involved in the uh, cyber maturity model development for DOD. I like that a lot. It's, it's a top level, you know, standards-based approach. It, it, it's not forward-looking, but it certainly eliminates a lot of the backward-looking kinds of things. Um, I would equate it to, and I did equate it to quality assurance. I mean, when you're welding, the threat is an untrained welder, improper equipment, improper procedures, uh, that kind of stuff. And so you put standards in for the training of the welder and the certification of the equipment and the inspection of the weld and stuff. And, and CMMC was intended is intended to do kind of the same thing. Uh, we know what the bad behavior is, and uh, and you put in procedures and, and checks to eliminate that. It's not forward looking, but just like welding, there's always a new welder comes in untrained and you know tries to go faster. There's a new manager that comes in and tries to make the welders work faster, and uh, so QA is always under a threat. It's not a deliberate threat, but it acts like it. And, and so uh, we have procedures for how to do the fix those kind of things. And then what's left is the new threats, the, the new creative ideas, the, the new attacks and stuff, but standards catch up with that. Eventually, NIST uh, moves, National Institute of Science and Technology moves pretty fast in their standards, I think. And they've started to invoke uh, uh, time-based standards, like instead of saying you have to use this operating system, they say you have to use the most current past version of an operating system. So that always keeps you no more than 30 days or a couple of weeks uh, up to speed. So so the, the threat only has a window of a week or two where there used to be, it might be months or, or, or even years afterwards. So, so, so I, my sense is the commercial world is moving pretty fast. Uh, we need to stay up with that. And, and I think in the government, we have some really good people at that. I'm sure they're doing their thing too. Uh, but making it common across the DOD is probably the challenge. Over. I, I, I couldn't agree. Mike, I can Mike's going to chime in. I'll let you have the the last comment, and we'll uh, we'll finish up here. Wow, thank you. Um, well, I couldn't agree more with the admiral. Uh, and, and the he's end. Not, he's, not, he, he's spot on. Um, you know, CMMC was a was relatively new and, and fairly innovative. Um, but I think the, the key thing there is recognizing that uh, industry has recognized that they need to uh, change that because of the constantly evolving cybersecurity threat. Uh, and we need to leverage uh, the commercial best practices and incorporate that into CMMC and then find a way to, to then replicate that throughout the department uh, as quickly as possible. That I, I agree that that will certainly be the challenge. So, so in a sense, uh, what he said. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, you know, we didn't think we were going to take the, the whole two hours, but I think it was a really cool conversation. There are more questions in our queue and, and comments in the chat. Um, that we don't have time to get to, but um, thank you for everyone in the audience for, for posing those, for thinking about modular open system architecture, which I see as a, as a good question there. We just didn't have time to get to you um, and, and for being part of this discussion. We did record this. Uh, it will be uh, posted up on our YouTube channel, hopefully in a few days. Um, and please, uh, uh, you know, 
accept our uh, our email outreaches to you as as we continue to connect with those of you who participate uh, in our events. You'll see our weekly newsletter, um, hopefully coming to you tomorrow, Friday morning. Um, there'll be some highlights of this event as well as kind of the weekly news of what's happening in acquisition research and federal government and, and, and things like that generally. Um, again, thank you to our panelists very much and to everyone for being here. And with that, goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.